good evening once again ladies and gentlemen thanks for joining us this evening uh, uh like before i you know officially like uh, introduce this event let me just like you know put the ball rolling uh, today like india has become the world's uh, second largest pt manufacturer in a matter of less than 100 days this is a remarkable story of an ambition driven innovation which this industry has been like you know showing from the day one it also shows that you know the limited possibilities that open up in india's government at the center it stays in the country uh, you know the dynamic private sector when they collaborate if india can make this template for the entire textile value chain foreign companies will find it an increasingly attractive investment destination it may therefore be a good idea to see how the learning from this exercise can be mapped internalized and applied across the textile chain today we are extremely fortunate to have among us you know, the experts from both academy and the industries before i introduce i wanted to you know give my special thanks to textuzil and its uh, chairman mr shrinivasan thank you very much sir thank you for participating for joining hands with us and um, sir it's over to you now uh, thank you friends it gives me great pleasure to welcome all the participants to this uh, knowledge revitalizing seminar on new learnings in textiles technology in the post covid world this is being organized by textprosil in association with business standard the idea of holding such a webinar was first proposed in an internal meeting that textprosil had with the honorable minister of textiles and women and child Dep development shrimati smriti zubin irani we are pleased to have the support of business standard in organizing the webinar and also welcome mr narshiman Uh, from chennai who is the moderator for today's session mr sarshiman has a lot of uh, insights into this technology advancement in various sectors including textiles across the country we are also grateful to have with us today two eminent panelists from india's top institutions dr ashwini agarwal from the department of textile technology at iit delhi and Pro professor asim tiwari from the department of mechanical engineering at iit mumbai who have agreed to an talk to us today about all the new tech technological advancements in uh, the textile industry we also have with us a young panel expert the entrepreneur mr rohan patodia co partner at dosit materials mr patodia comes from a family which has a rich heritage in textiles and he has made successful forays into technical textiles and is here to share his practical experiences in deploying uh, in the internet of things solutions for utility management in an indian factory the textile industry as you know was the forefront of what was the industrial revolution back in the 18th century and was one of the first industries to use modern industrial production methods we have come a long way since then and many innovations have led to, led to improvement in efficiency over the years as we speak today much has been said about how the nation can use the covid-19 opportunity to redefine its future can we turn the crisis into an opportunity and what kind of machinery will the industry need to raise its productivity post covid the textile world is now abuzz with the news of the launch of antiviral textiles and products indian textile companies have converted the pandemic induced economic crisis into an opportunity by coming out with antiviral textiles i'm sure our expert dr ashwini agarwal will bring out more perspectives with his expertise on this subject it's time for the industry to introspect and bring in scientific temper it's time to look at new possibilities and leverage new technology a panel expert professor asim tiwari has a strong understanding of using artificial intelligence and iot in the textile process as social distancing and no contact processes are becoming norm today for conducting business i'm sure his presentation will be a great help new technologies in our business the indian sector uh, textile sector post covid is aware of the success story of the ppe manufacturing industry three this industry has grown to a size of 100 crores which speaks a lot for our entrepreneurs little did we know that even the msmes with scalability and production challenges and environmental norms to follow could join hands with large firms to lead india to become the second largest ppe manufacturer in the world which is indeed a creditable achievement 
With the pandemic here to stay, it will be crucial to focus on building efficiencies that will enable creation of manufacturing excellence through cost effectiveness to ward off business risk to the Indian textiles and clothing sector from other manufacturing nations. The discussion in today's webinar will familiarize our manufacturers with the technological means required to maximize their internal capabilities and to work with shorter lead times and tighter margins. We have a challenging future in front of us and I'm sure the webinar will throw some light on how we need to face it. Thank you very much and again a warm welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, with this, we'll start this, uh, you know, session. We, uh, our first speaker will be Mr. Dr. Rashwini Agarwal. So, sir, no over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank Texposal for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share my uh, viewpoint. Uh, I just share my slides. <clears throat> Uh, can you see can you see my slides yeah yeah okay so so we're going to discuss uh, a philosophical manner in a philosophical manner how we can think about uh, putting value to a textile especially cotton textiles because this is uh, this is a panel for uh, trying to find what we can do best with our cotton uh, industry so if we look at the traditional textile industry today, what we find is that uh, most of it, uh, if you look at a global scenario, what we see is that uh, a lot of uh, manufacturing is now moving away from India into Middle East countries, uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, etc. Uh, because of the competitiveness, cost sensitive market in a traditional apparel textile. So what is left is actually a fashion and functional apparel zone, where what we, when we talk about fashion or functional, we really are talking about uh, creating local niche market within the country or abroad and trying to have a better value realization. And other than that, then there's a technical textile segment where are there are 12 different segments. I have just listed three, which are very important, which is home tech, uh, mobile tech and meditech, where, where the cotton can play a very good role. So if you look at uh, how USA is doing, because USA is also not uh, supposed to be a very big textile hub. But uh, you will be surprised to know that as per NPCTO report, uh, USA is doing uh, well in some sectors and they're actually exporting a significant amount uh, of material in 2018. A, this is a chart which is given here where cotton wool and fine animal fiber is about 6.7 billion and they have a fabric export of 9.1 billion, which shows that there is a, there is a possibility of actually uh, doing something in traditional as well as functional textile arena by countries like US can also do and they can export to other countries. So we should also be able to do a better job than them. If you look at the EU, uh, all European Union countries, they're also, if you see that in medical textiles and non womens they are doing exceedingly well. They have a trade surplus. They're actually exporting to other countries. And in all other sectors also, they have a fairly good uh, share of market. Uh, which they are able to uh, capture and export. So which is, uh, which is uh, important, that means with all the kind of costs which, is, which they have in their countries, they are able to survive and they are able to actually export earn money. So we need to really learn what is that which is making them do or earn these kinds of uh, um, exports and these kinds of productivity. So factors for growth which has been seen recently, which has changed the textile industry or is changing right now, you may be well aware of this. The first very factor is the fashion and lifestyle. This is with the new generation coming up, uh, the lifestyle has become uh, a call for the day. People are really looking for fashion statements and work, uh, work profile based lifestyle. So uh, any textile material which we have to put into the market, we need to look at these expanding segments. Uh, which are now becoming over uh, demanding. Similarly, if you look at new application areas, that means uh, areas based on uh, new 
jobs uh, kind of uh, online for example pp is a medical kind of an area where something is required or uh, uniform which is very appropriate for a particular application for a job uh, the other thing is the consumer preference so consumers are moving towards more green approach they are looking at something more comfortable natural something which is not harming anyone social aspects of certain kind of print and certain kind of custom uh, or traditional prints or traditional materials or new ethnic designs so there are a lot of changes in consumer preferences and consumers have now a say what they want to uh, buy and what they want to hear and the last point is uh, the environment uh, environment is changing we all know that we are going through very difficult times global warming is going up climate changes are happening and people are very sensitive to sustainability which has become a very big issue uh, nowadays so let me give you some case studies of companies how they are trying to survive and make money in, in these times of high competition so this is a case study of ghcl which is making bed sheets and what they have come to now bed sheets is such a big business a lot of companies are doing it but they have tried to make a niche by using fibers from recycled pet uh, that is polyester bottles and converting them into fibers and then mixing them with cotton and and making it a sustainable product something which uh, which can find value in the environment from the environment point of view and then tagging them with that this is actually authentic so not that something is a marketing gimmick they are actually doing a job what they are claiming so they are tagging it using a dna a kind of a molecule from applied dna science and they have actually created a market for themselves Uh, based on these recycled fibers and cotton mixed bed sheets another company which is uh, which has made a uh, lot of news is 37.5 37.5 is nothing but body temperature so what they claim is that their materials are able to keep your body cool or warm depending on the outside condition so these are not phase change materials what they have used are something called volcanic sands uh, which can have uh, both uh, heat absorbing and liberating properties and they are able to cool faster by evaporation so they are able to manage you can see the figure on on the right so this is a microclimate next to the skin and they are able to manage the heat and vapor transport by their materials and they are thus they are claiming for their customers that they can really do a wonderful job by maintaining comfort levels to a very high or a very high degree so so new generation and people who are active and who actively participate in sports and uh, running or cycling they they love to have things like this and there's a big growing market for such products this is a this is a indian startup nimans uh, what they have come out with is a merino wool based shoes it's a natural fiber based material mostly shoes are synthetic but they have come out with a merino wool uh, kind of material which they say that you can wash them and they are comfortable to wear and they are actually on the sole also they are using recycled rubber and polymers which are derived from natural resources so again the call here is of sustainability looking at environment comfort and using natural products rather than synthetic products so they are trying to um, make a pitch on that next uh, slide which i am showing here is of under armor which is a usa company which again what they have come up with very small simple concepts of replacing elastin fiber so we all use lycra and elastin in our materials for make stretchability comfort and uh, better fitting but what they have come up have come out with the pitches that elastin is a fiber which has poor durability it loses its stretchy stretchability and relaxation with time and uh, it it has a poor drying time it holds on to the moisture it holds on to the odor so it is not something which is good so they have replaced it with some another uh, stretchable yarn which is a textured yarn technique and use some modified polymers to do a same job as lycra or elastin does and then they have been with time uh, putting all other kinds of materials so that they can trap heat inside uh, inside their um, uh, jacket or uh, or uh, whatever textiles they are using and trying to make comfortable materials so small very small concepts but trying to market it a unique thing which can bring uh, novelty to the product is what making them find inroads into a very difficult and uh, competitive market very recently uh, aditya birla birla cellulose has launched another material called antimicrobial fibers just 3 4 days back they have done a launch and what they are claiming is fashionable drapeable material 
which is antiviral, antibacterial, it is water resistant, it is wash durable, and the biggest pitch is it's natural and sustainable. All the resources are from nature and what you, when, when you throw it out, nothing remains and everything can go back to the nature. And to prove that whatever they're claiming is actually, actually you can trace it, you can see that you're getting it in your product. So they have put a tracer tracing tracer technology in it uh, so that it can be traced up to the final product. So the question comes here is, so these are examples not related just to cotton, not to cotton, but to various kinds of innovations in textile area. Now, since we are more concerned about cotton, let's talk about whether cotton is outdated. Is it really losing its market and use and we are not really going to have any anything out? Uh, I beg to differ. Actually, no, it is one of the best fibers we have. Rather, I would say it is the best fiber we have in textile. So something which we have very good, how can we say that it is losing market? Rather, it cannot lose market. If it is losing market, it is because of us. So what are the, we know all these things. It is a fiber which is not, not expensive anymore. I mean, there was a time when polyester was very cheap and cotton was losing uh, because of the cost. There may be still uh, times, depending on supply demand situation, that cotton prices may fluctuate. So uh, does the polyester fiber uh, prices, but it is still not very, very expensive. It is uh, really in the same bracket of cost. But the best thing is it's a very versatile fiber. That means it can be used in variety of making variety of uh, fabrics and variety of applications in many ways. Best part is it is naturally breathable and it is cool to the skin. I mean, uh, it's a touch is very good. If you look at polyester, they fight for this property even today. And it is soft to the skin. It's non-abrasive, it's non-allergic, it's rather called hypoallergic. Um, it's it's a uh, fairly strong fiber, okay, not as strong as polyester, but fairly strong fiber. It can last uh, easily a, a lifetime for a wearer. And uh, it is easy to wash, easy to maintain, very biggest, very big thing, non-static, so it doesn't get spoiled so easily. Polyester gets soiled very, very easily. And it's very difficult to clean. This uh, is not there with the problem with the, with, the, with the cotton fiber. And it is insulating in nature and it traps air because it is able to trap uh, air if you make a yarn out of it. So what does this mean to a company? If you really, I mean, all these properties which I said are known in the literature. So nothing new here. But if you put it to the customer, customer has actually forgotten many of these things. If you look at uh, cotton market, those who realize these values, they are still buying cotton. And even if it is expensive, even if it is of prime value, they will go ahead and buy it because they realize those values. But marketing is such a thing and putting it in a manner is such a thing that people have forgotten cotton and they have moved on to other materials just because of the market pitch. But all these things which are good points are there uh, with, with cotton and we have to reinvent it in a manner that it becomes uh, useful for people. So one of the most important thing is sustainable material. It is the most sustainable material. If viscose can be thought of sustainable, cotton definitely is more sustainable. It's a natural resource. It's a recyclable resource. It is non-toxic, easy to dispose. There is no problem from that end. There are other sustainable issues. I'll come to them later. But uh, many, many companies just make, just using natural materials make it sustainable. Uh, and cotton really falls into it very easily. And on top of it, it's very easy to manufacture. You can make textiles, dye it, process it, print it, finish it very easily in bright colors without any problem. So it's easy to man make. Other fibers are much, much more, uh, much, much more challenging. If you look at uh, the benefits to the customers, as I said, you can say it is soft and breathable. It's comfortable to wear. It's better night sleep. So people spend a lot of money if they want a better night's sleep. I mean, people sell mattresses and bed sheets and bed covers and uh, night wears and all kinds of things to just to make uh, sleep better. And cotton naturally gives you a comfortable sleep, a comfortable uh, night out. It's also a very safe fiber to wear. It's hypoallergic, as I told you. On top of it, it is non-electrostatic, so it doesn't cling, which is a problem with a lot of synthetic fibers and especially polyester fiber. And then, it is quite safe if you wear, uh, wear it near a heat source, which is you are cooking something and polyesters are not, not meant to be brought near to the, they can actually make burns on your skin if you come very close. So though it is flammable, but it is non melting which means it is safe uh, till it uh, catches fire. So 
there is there is a safety inbuilt in this fiber and on if you look at the value to the customer as i said very easy to wash very easy to keep uh, easy care material uh, it has odor resistance or automatic odor resistance it doesn't uh, get to have a foul smell very easily while polyester synthetic fibers can easily become uh, bacteria prone and fouling you can just wear uh, you can actually keep on wearing because of that and wash less if you like like jeans etc you don't really have to wash them too, too many times if you look at pill problem again compared to polyester cotton has very very minimal pill problem so these are the major advantages of cotton and we need to now market Uh, these points one by one to to the people in a manner so that it becomes uh, a real customer value and people start to see uh, the share of cotton how it can go so, but share of cotton is still going down by because other companies and other fibers are actually pitching against it and trying to really market its negative points to show their positive points so they don't talk about the positive points of cotton but they talk about the negative points of cotton and let's see what those cotton negative points are so from sustainability i said there is it's a sustainable fiber but then there are some issues and these issues are often uh, given a lot of uh, sound one is using insecticides pesticides water consumption energy consumption in growing uh, growing growing cotton which is true so we need to be looked at uh, issues how we can reduce insecticides and pesticides we need to look Look at how water can be used less, or energy can be used less in what we call green cotton or a bio cotton or cottons of better uh, variety. So this is something which is not in our hands, but yes, as the nation or as a cotton producer, we must look at issues so that environmental issues can, uh, which are related to cotton, uh, are minimized. So people don't make that kind of a noise about it. If you look at social issues, yes, again, it's it's a industry where. agriculture is uh, is part of it so labor becomes an issue working conditions become an issue and people are not paid well at times and and working conditions are hard so we need to work on uh, those aspects so that people are not able to raise fingers on cotton that cotton is is not a good fiber to use because it is an environmental hazard or a social socially unacceptable uh, way of uh, making it if we look at the technological uh, challenges then one of the Uh, some i have listed some of the most important technological challenges in cotton which one is the shrinkage so this is something which industry can easily uh, target and sometimes we lose the value of cotton in in the eyes of customer because many brands don't care about it or many other non brand items they don't care about high fiber shrinks at the consumer end that really puts off a person who buys a fit and then the, after washing the material does not really fit at all so we can really make uh, cotton um, quite shrink proof it's not that other uh, other fibers do not shrink but they cotton somehow because during these during the manufacturing cycle it shrinks more we try to take an advantage by stretch it so we need to let go such things which are going to put customer off we have to make sure that the customer is happy buying a cotton because the cotton will fit as as, as it is bought from the market another important thing while technology is very easily available for making wash fast colors light fast colors in cotton people put colors which bleed continuously bleed up wash after wash keeps on fading with the light and makes a short user life so people don't want to buy things a very good thing and then throw them away in just one or two or three washes because they have faded the light has the the, the color has gone out for a light or or, or it has faded with time so and that is one of the reason why polyester is grain gaining market because it remains fresh and as it is good for a long time and people like that in some countries where weather is not such a big issue we need to remove this problem of fastness shrinkage from cotton so that people when they buy cotton which is a natural fiber sustain uh, fiber sustainable fiber uh, comfortable fiber it also serves them for a long time uh, when they when they buy it the other major issue which comes against cotton is slow drying so we must look at technologies to somehow uh, if we are going for sports uh, kind of t-shirts and and trousers and other kind of materials then we have to look at or active wear we have to look at drying times and we can create finishes for cotton which will make cotton easy to dry or less uh, less able to hold moisture for a long time 
so such things we need even innovations to really target uh, some of these things similarly crease another thing it can't be it's, uh, we we say crease resistant fabrics are available but then they use all kinds of chemicals which may not be very good uh, for environment and for uh, user so we have to look at technologies of making it crease resistant and the last point which is most important is uh, cotton is not seen as a fashion fabric by many one of the reason polyester has grown so big is because of fashion industry they want shimmery material that is why viscose is also going up because it's a shiny material and uh, translucent uh, material things can be made out of it and it can cre create lots of fashion uh, statements you have to really start thinking about how cotton can be made to look more fashionable and it's not that it cannot be done people have done it um there are um, methods and technologies and one has to look at how one can make even very fine patterns or uh, translucent patterns or uh, try to mix it with other materials to make it more a fashion statement so that they become more shiny more body hugging and uh, create trying to create shapes uh, with the user so what is needed is a new thinking a creating a special space and that will come from five points i have written here four most is the innovation we have i have told you some of the positive points which are very very strong positive points about cotton which no other fiber has and i have told you about some negative points which are because of bad practices in industry we need to really look at innovations to solve those problems some some special effects which we can create some uniqueness which we can create whether we can make them very good um, uh, very good uh, shrink resistant materials or very durable fast materials Uh, which are safe to wear and have other additional properties i'll come to some of those properties second we make it more sustainable uh, environmentally and third we need to look at that we are socially responsible uh, industry we look after our uh, workers we look after our, our farmers and we try to create products which are uh, socially uh, acceptable practices in the industry and all these things if we say it is innovative we have done something new it's a new kind of a cotton it's a new um, a new property it is a sustainable material it's a social we are uh, observing all social responsibility then one should be able to verify these claims one should be able to say yes you have done this it's not that you are just claiming it as a advertisement and actually person is getting the same material as any other company is giving then you will not get the value out of it so you need to find ways of making those claims verifiable a customer should be able to say yes i bought a original authentic material and based on that then you have to create a brand out of it so that you are segregated as a cotton producer of a high value from any other cotton producer or cotton um, textile manufacturer who has not doing has who has not done any of these things so when we talk about innovation let's talk about then 1.1 each point one at a time first is innovation so when we talk about innovation we are talking about novel finishes to mitigate lessen the, the technological challenges which are shrink proofing wash and light fast processing coating and lamination on textiles giving antiviral or antimicrobial finishes depending on the time now now are the time for antiviral and antimicrobial uh, more than ever uh, water repellency moisture management and anti crease effects so these words are not new words these are all old words but uh, one should not just keep on using technologies which were uh, which were used 10 years back or 20 years back because people have not found value out of it you have to as i gave you some of the case studies you have to create some kind of a niche one one property which is very unique and you have found a new way of doing it a new technology of doing it which is safer which is uh, more uh, uh, more effective uh, to the and next very important point in innovation is the fashion you have to bring uh, we have to make a balance between the fashion uh, and the innovation which you brought so that your material is now a fashion material which people can use to design fashion clothing when we talk about sustainability or social responsibility was one of the most important thing as i said is when we are using finishes we have to not use harmful chemicals anymore so we have to remove uh, traditional chemicals and actually bring in innovative new chemicals which are being supplied by companies or uh, getting researched by new companies 
Uh, and you can also uh, evolve uh, chemicals if you are capable of making such uh, materials in your factory so that you can put certain things which are not been in the market earlier. You, start, you can also start using other natural materials uh, for those finishes, for those uh, laminations or coatings uh, along with cotton. So it becomes all natural kind of a material. And then avoid social exploitation, as I said. Uh, and somehow there are certifications, a lot of them now, which you can really uh, work upon and work in. And then create a balance between fashion and sustainability. The next, once we have done innovation, we have made, we are sustainable. Uh, we, I said you have to have a, uh, some kind of a reliability or a method to track or uh, say that, yes, what you have done is right. So that comes into quality and reliability. And there you have to work in for international certifications, uh, which are which are recognized everywhere. So if you're making antiviral fabric, it should be actually certified internationally that yes, it is. If it is antimicrobial, it should be certified. Uh, if it is safe to be used for certain uh, kind of uh, applications, it should be certified for that. So international certifications for all kinds of sustainable manufacturing, which you have done, whether, whether you are uh, following practices, which are more uh, uh, beneficial to the environment, uh, less, uh, less impact on the environment, for example, there are certifications which you could go for uh, to prove that your manufacturing practices are good. And you have to show that your effects are durable with washings, they remain, they remain effective, they don't harm the environment. To do all this, you can have not only certification, you can also put some tracer marks. Now, one of the things which I have seen in the market is now uh, polyester is being pushed as cotton. Um, because they, they can put very good finishes initially, which wash off eventually. Uh, it feels like cotton, it looks like cotton, but actually it's not cotton. So they are really they're counterfeiting cotton and killing your market. So you need to find ways of counterfeiting uh, so that a natural cotton, uh, a cotton made using right ingredients are, are shown to the people. So you can put tracer markers. Uh, there are companies which do that and you can create your own markers also so that confidence is built in the customers and customers are able to look at your product in a different manner altogether. And then comes obviously the branding. Once you've done all this, you don't want people to get confused. They should be able to uh, look for your name and buy uh, with peace of mind that this company is an environmental conscious company. It's a social responsible company. It cares for the customer because it gives a value. It gives finishes. It gives uh, treatments which are good for the customer and it's value driven and it gives a verifiable change. So you have to build that. You have to work for all, all these four or five things uh, so that you not only in India, you can then uh, export worldwide using that. Name. One of the last slides I'm going to use now is a case study, uh, a company in Australia, which is called Cotton On uh, Group. They have actually created a whole uh, a host of companies. One is Cotton On Kids for kids fashion gear. Cotton on body, which is intimate beer, sleep beer, and lifestyle beer. Factory, which is for youth fashion. Supri, which is a keeping in mind the modern girl, the 21st century working girl uh, fashion. And then Ruby, which is footwear and uh, sorry for the spelling and accessories, etc. And then Typo, which is your tech wear. You know, office, the decker, the uh, uh, on the desk, what can be there on the walls, what can be there, and things like that. So there's a typo. And they have tried to create huge, huge, huge range of materials and they have uh, thousands of stores worldwide uh, selling these things. So one can actually create and there, there are many other, um, there are many other such case studies. One of, uh, I don't remember now the name, but uh, one group of uh, young people, they have started a startup where they have started putting water repellent cotton shirts and uh, stain resistant uh, materials and they're just selling it on web and they are really going very fast. So uh, such kind of companies can be created, such kinds of uh, product lines can be created, but definitely you have to put some innovation somewhere and you have to prove and show that innovation works. So with this, I would like to uh, stop here and uh, answer and take any questions if they are there. Uh, what can the, we do some kind of work in this area of uh, making functional materials and finishes, if you need to learn about us, you can go to smita-itd.com site and learn about our work from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much. It was an interesting presentation.
uh, and especially interesting case studies. So the four buzzwords, innovation, natural, which is like almost a buzzword among the millennials today, if I may say so. And of course, social responsibility, which you know, carefully looked into it because I had the pleasure of like going and visiting many of these clusters across the country. I can only one thing which I can vouch for is like the way they take care of the people, you know, the environment or the social causes. So, and last but not the least, branding and of course, you know, how technology is. Uh, uh, we are we have requested all the participants to post their questions in the in the chat box. So at the end end of the uh, uh, the third speaker, we will take all the questions together and I request all the participants to post their questions uh, so that I please mention to whom this, these questions are meant to. You know, that will be easy for us to take it. I hope that is, that, that format sounds okay, okay for you. Yeah. We will wait for the questions and then like, we will we'll go, go towards that. So before I call upon the next speaker, uh, Professor, I have two questions if I may ask you. you know, I mean, in your presentation, you detailed about the future of textiles in fabrics that do something. But if you're like, uh, especially MSMEs, the way MSMEs plan their business and strategy around functional finish and fibers, do you see the scope available for them? Yes, very much. Rather, MSMEs are probably uh, rightly placed to put anything new, which is a bit of uh, uh, a risky proposition to begin with. Uh, which cannot, that means cannot be put in very large scales. So SMEs are the right size to really look at new finishes, create markets for them and actually push it. So rather, uh, not only MSME, MSMEs, uh, I think just startups, which do not really fall in any category, they just started, they started doing very well when they hold on to a new idea and a new concept and they build upon it. So yes, I think oh, they that's can. A, that's a great news. So uh, you also said the future of of textiles is in doing that things differently, adding and creating new values, value adds for foreign customers. But do you feel the global demand for sustainable solutions can be achieved in the current Indian environment and settings? So yes, uh, again, uh, this can be divided into two parts because textile industry has to rely on materials from agriculture. So uh, sustainability comes both from agriculture front and from the industrial front. So yes, uh, bringing both the parties together is a little challenge in our country, uh, but definitely uh, industry can start to do its part and probably work with uh, manuf uh, gro growers to, to give uh, a cotton which is more bio cotton or we say organic cotton uh, and then work into sustainability because people in India have now started working on organic supplies and working with, uh, with the smaller groups uh, to create or grow such kind of materials for them. So I think it should be possible for cotton as well. Okay, that's a great news. Thank you, Professor. Thank you once again. Next uh, next speaker, Professor Ashim Tiwari. Um, so, sir, the stage is yours. Okay. So I essentially wanted to talk about Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence taking, uh, I would say, a different turn from what Professor Agarwal had been talking so far about more specifically on the on the cotton aspects. So I'm talking of the, the real big thing which is happening in the industry today, which is coming off artificial intelligence. So before I really get into artificial intelligence, I just wanted to quickly touch upon one other thing, which is technical textile. I have a very large activity happening in the area of composites and technical textile, primarily composites, woven fabrics and things like that. Okay. So, so this is all what I'm going to talk about the composites in my, in my talk. If anyone is interested, they can of course contact me. I very closely work with a lot of uh, colleagues of mine and this is the cyber physical systems and data analytics group, which we have, which has people from uh, uh, various departments, but primarily from mechanical engineering and uh, a lot of students and researchers and a lot of industry collaborators. So for instance, Rohan Patodia also is a very close collaborator in many of my activities. So we have a very vibrant group, which is working on various activities, primarily related to cyber physical systems and data analytics. So I want to quickly jump onto and tell as to what really is artificial intelligence. Now, I think this is something which we all have been hearing for a while, but as a matter of fact, artificial intelligence has started more than 50 to 60 years back. So the word has been coined way back in 1950s. So it's nothing new in terms of the word artificial intelligence, 
but it has only gained prominence in the last 10 years. So, so yeah, so artificial intelligence is basically uh, a much bigger area, which started in 1950s. The world was coined in 1950s and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. And what I really would like to talk about is how AI is changing the industry. So machine learning becomes a subset which essentially has an idea that all the information is contained in the data. And if you have the data, you could use that to learn patterns. Now, artificial intelligence in general is a ability of a machine to imitate human behavior. Whereas machine learning is a much smaller subset of that, which is looking at identifying patterns and making decisions or predicting without human intervention. Next slide. So now in, in machine learning, you could talk about basic three categories. One is a supervised learning. The other is unsupervised learning. And the third is the reinforcement learning. We would not really be talking a lot about reinforcement learning, but examples of supervised and unsupervised learning are very common in industry. So supervised learning is where you actually know what the outcomes would be. And thus your training of the machine learning algorithms is based on an un, on a known fact, which is the outcomes. And thus you supervise the training and that is known as supervised learning. Primarily regression and classifications are a part of supervised learning. On the other hand, unsupervised learning is an area where you really do not know what the outcome is. You do not know the answers, but you have a lot of data. And that's when you start looking at data clustering, change point detections and dimensionality reduction. For instance, if you have seen something in the past, you can train your model from that past data, then that is supervised learning. However, if you'd like to have your machine learning model look at some future instance which has never been seen in the past, then you would like to have it work on unsupervised learning where it actually sees something new and figures it out, but has not been trained in the past. Next slide, please. So, so machine learning essentially started by what we now know uh, we call as, as classical machine learning. So this is essentially something which started in the 80s and 90s. And this was based on a lot of different theories, information-based theories, similarity-based theories, probability-based learning, and error-based learning. We also started having expert system-based learning. However, these classical machine learning techniques have a limitation to themselves. Beyond a certain limit, they cannot improve their performance. So no matter how much you train these classical machine learning models, they cannot perform better after a while. And this is something like a uh, uh, inherent nature of these classical machine learning algorithms. For instance, you could not train your, your, you know, you can teach your dog, for instance, a lot of tricks, but beyond the limit, no matter how much you train it, it cannot do complex mathematics, for instance. So that is where you see the graph on the right that the conventional or classical machine learning kind of plated down. However, about 10 years back, there was a resurgence in the machine learning community and something known as deep learning started. And deep learning changed the entire, I would say, uh, playing field. And deep learning became something which could surpass the performance of conventional machine learning and the classical machine learning and go far beyond. However, it was of course data hungry. So the more data you give it, the better the performance would become. And deep learning became so good that it could actually beat humans. So today we are living in a world where Deep learning is able to perform tasks better than humans in many specific areas. And the two things which are very commonly looked at in deep learning are convolutional, convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. These are the two deep learning techniques. Next slide, please. So now if you look at the artificial intelligence evolution, we started with AI about 50, 60 years back, as I said. And that was something where you had simple regressions or you had uh, very definite cost functions and you were developing the models. So it was a rule based approach where the persons used to develop a rule and you used to program it in the machines. All your CNC machines are essentially the first artificial intelligence machines in some sense, because they have a rule which we have derived. However, if we do not know a rule, but we do know that the, what is right and what is wrong, then we can perform that using the current deep learning techniques, which now we call as the artificial narrow intelligence, ANI. And currently we are living in the area when, or, or the time when we are in the second wave of intelligence, which is known as artificial narrow intelligence. 
here we do not know need to know the rules we just need to know what is right and what is wrong and the machine will figure out rules a very classical example of this is that if you see a cat or a dog you can very easily figure out which is a cat which is a dog but you cannot really come up with rules because there are millions of different kinds of cats there are hundreds of different kinds of dogs and how would you be able to come up with a rule which you can teach the the machine so you do not know a rule but you do know the answer so if you know the answer you let the machine figure out the rule and that is really the biggest i would say change which has happened in last 10 years it has primarily been driven by hardwares computational hardwares which could perform very complex deep network simulations and and calculations next slide please so just to tell you what really is the current possibilities i would very easily say that the current possibilities of deep learning are almost as good as human in almost majority of cases which we do on a daily basis so any task which human does deep learning can do that specific task better than us almost any and the almost is of course the catch word so there are few tasks which it cannot so this is just an example of google deep learning retinopathy so they train the the deep learning networks to identify the patient conditions based on retina image and they could predict the age they could predict the gender they could predict the blood pressure they could predict whether the person was diabetic or not and they could also predict the body mass index of a person just by looking at the retina now this is a kind of information which your doctor will not be able to decipher by looking at your retina however the deep learning network was able to do that so i'm just trying to give you some examples next slide please this is another example of how deep learning can you click next again yeah so this is oh, sorry okay please go back i think the animation is not working that's okay so this is a a deep learning network which has been trained to read lips so it can do lip reading so for instance if you see someone but you have the person muted in the television your deep learning algorithms can look at it and predict what the person is speaking and now these libraries are openly available people can actually use them and they can further retrain them for different languages so you can train it for your for your local language or you could train it for a specific dialect and things like that and this is something which is not really possible for every human to do next slide please not just reading your lips but you could actually also have the person read your mind and deep learning can be used to decipher images which are there in your mind this is just to give an example so the image on the left top left is that of a of a of a tiger and the bottom image is what the computer reconstructed by looking at an mri of the brain so the deep learning network could figure out what you are seeing without really looking at what you're seeing so it could just read your brain so not only can it read your lip it can read your brain so if you see the washing machine or the fly which the person is looking and the computer is able to generate based on the mri of your brain as to what you are seeing so now deep learning has become extremely potent beyond what many of the human skills are next slide please just to give you a more practical example of this self driving cars now this is something which is a reality millions of kilometers have been done by the google self driving car and they are very very safe as a matter of fact they are at least 10 times safer than human drivers or more and with time they are improving so this is something which is already happening it has been happening for several years you can order a pizza and it can be delivered to you by a self driving drive and driven car in us next slide please see that the the possibilities are immense unique aspect where we were looking at solving differential equations and a researcher recently published that you can solve very complex mathematical problems without really understanding anything about the mathematics so this deep learning network has no understanding of mathematics it just learns from the symbols and it finally figures out what the answers are and it is able to beat mathematica maple and matlab which are the which are the benchmarks for the for the mathematical community so this is just to show that the deep learning is a brute force method which does not need to understand the domain knowledge but can in a sense learn what what the answers will be next slide please and this is really becoming like an explosion because things are happening in all possible fields and this is just to tell you a, a small glimpse so for instance the alpha go 
the world champion of of the go uh, board game was beaten by alpha go google alpha go could beat it now we have alpha go 0 which is far more potent than alpha go which is was the original one made by by the google artificial intelligence can also do a lot of very unique things for instance they can write poetry they can create music they can create paintings as a matter of fact one of the novels in japan was almost about to win an a literary award which was written by ai facebook regularly uses for kids short stories written by ais however with all of these realistic looking aspects of ai ai also is not you know completely uh, away from human in, in its behavior and is prone to the same problems which humans are so for instance the atari playing ai wanted to win so badly that it started cheating so ai has a very strange side to it as well next slide please so all what i'm trying to say is that artificial intelligence has become extremely powerful in narrow areas it's not really yet in a generalized area but narrow areas it can so i'm just going to give you some examples of what research we are doing and how it can be used in the context of textile industry so we are for instance doing a lot of video analytics and video research in which we could look at videos identify faces unique people can be identified their gender their age their dress colors and other things can be identified just by looking at the videos and this can be done completely by an artificial intelligence agent no human intervention is required now this can be used for instance on a shop floor so you can id a shop floor worker you could look at if there is a hazardous situation if someone is working in a shop floor and something happens where you need to intervene you could also have work protocol conformity assessment so you can see if the person is actually following the the basic rules is always wearing ppe for instance now for instance this is a very big thing all these aspects can be done and this all can be done without any human in the loop artificial intelligence can completely look at this cycle time and efficiency determination and i'll talk about one of the examples in which which we tried this in the garment factory and loss time assessment next slide please for instance pose estimation is a very very powerful thing where you can actually real time see the pose of people or see the motion direction and this could be something which could be used to capture best practices in a shop floor so if you see that these are best practices ai can automatically figure out what would be the best practices and what would not be the best practices next slide please we have of course also used the the artificial intelligence and deep networks for oncological aspects so not just for for shop floor and, and pose identification but you could also look at carcinomas and predict if the slides in this specific case we are looking at a ct specimen we can predict if the ct specimen has cancer in it or not and the bottom right image is the predicted label and whereas the bottom middle image is the one which has been looked at by an oncologist and we are able to very precisely predict by just looking at at the ct images of uh, mri next please so going forward we have developed a series of iot devices now where does iot fit in all of this now iot is internet of things and internet of things is essentially a a small microcontroller device which has sensors and capability to communicate over the network now this is something which really is the heart of artificial intelligence the reason is that artificial intelligence works on data so you need to feed data to ai models but how do you create data at a shop floor you create data by creating data through these iot devices so what you see on the bottom left is an iot device developed by us and we have many different kinds of iot devices which have been developed this is specific case we look at current voltage and accelerometer data and it is sent real time and the graphs on the bottom right are showing some of the graphs of that and the actual machine is shown on the left side which is a 3 axis cnc machine and we have created a virtual cyber twin of this machine which is essentially a incarnation of this machine in the cyber space which has all the real time data which is actually present on the machine available to you in the cyber space so essentially you can think about a a, a second life of this machine living in the cyber space which is having all the real time data and is augmented by artificial intelligence next slide please to understand what is happening i'll very quickly go over some of the other case studies this is a very detailed set of uh, tools which we have developed which we call as the machine monitoring and analytics for total productivity and maintenance so, so this is a set of tools which we have developed 
where we can install the IoT devices on machines and they could look at plant operation efficiency, they could look at quality and predict monitor, they can predict uh, quality, they can look at equipment condition monitoring, tool wear, and many other aspects associated with this. Next slide, please. And this is just to show you, this slide is showing you how this entire structure works. We have IoT devices which are installed on the shop floor. They send the data to the cloud. The cloud has both the IoT server as the data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence machine, which does all the processing and sends the data back to either the shop floor or the, or the plant management and they can see what is happening. And you can figure out pie charts of what are the reasons for losses, where are the main uh, inherent you know, flaws? Is it a management loss or is it an operational loss? What are the different aspects associated with this? This is something which we have installed in one of the aerospace companies in Bangalore on a, on a pilot basis. Next slide, please. Now looking at one another aspect, which is a very big aspect in industries, especially in cotton industries, is the power utilization and power management. There are many activities in a textile industry which are very power intensive. For instance, drying is one of them. So fabric drying is extremely power intensive and it's also almost not always the most efficient way of doing things. So you may actually have an inefficient way of doing it. Moreover, you have an open loop system where you essentially bone dry everything and then, then go ahead and do other things which may not be even required. So we have a set of IoT devices which can perform a very detailed power management for the entire plant and provide you a one single window understanding of what is happening and you could optimize your utilizations. It also looks at power anomalies like voltage spike, current spike, sine wave and other aspects. Next slide please. So another uh, very useful device which we have come up with which we call as ASIS. Well, this is a staff productivity measurement tool which can be installed in an IT kind of a setup where you may be having people sitting in the desk of and on computers and, and developing things. And this monitors as to how is the utilization of assets happening? Are the licenses of the software being properly used? Are people spending too much time on Facebook and, 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 and other aspects rather than actually working? And this is all in a very small device which just goes on the computer and it can provide all of that information. Next slide, please. So now, this is one other activity which we had come up with and one of my colleagues actually had derived, which was to come up with a decision making system for maintenance. So selective maintenance based on, and this was done for the Indian uh, army, where they were looking at their tanks and the utilization of the tank and depending upon the scenario, whether it's a peacetime scenario, war exercise, a war like scenario one or a war like scenario two, based on that, you would have to keep your maintenance scheduled such that you are able to provide the reliability to a mission, whichever you may want to take a very elaborate process. Don't want to go into the details of this, but just to tell you that this was something which was developed by for the Indian army. Next slide, please. A somewhat similar thing was done for the uh, Indian Navy, which was more on the equipments, which are on the on board on a, on a ship. And this was essentially a project which was taken up. It just got finished a while back where we were able to provide reliability and choices to the captain when, when they are going for a specific mission. Next slide, please. Another few specific things. So there's a lot of mathematics which is involved in the, at the back of it, which can perform all of this. So for instance, this is to show that you can do condition monitoring, tool condition monitoring by continuous data. So you could predict real time tool wear and you could predict an imminent failure in advance and thus save a lot of time. And this is something now which is very commonly done and is possible. And we have developed several such techniques. Next slide, please. A very unique experiment which we did, and this is from an example from that, where we were looking at a continuous casting in a steel manufacturing facility. And in that continuous caster, there is a thing known as break point, where the continuous caster develops a small break and the liquid metal flows out. And this is a very, very uh, dangerous situation because the liquid metal is at 1500 degrees centigrade. It spills all over the caster. It stops the entire machine and it's almost half a day to a day exercise to bring it back. Needless to say, a lot of losses. And thus we came up with a machine learning artificial intelligence program, which could predict this. However, the challenge was that this had to be predicted in a matter of microsecond milliseconds. So actually the answer had to be brought out in less than 250 milliseconds, because if we are delayed by more than that, 
then it would not be possible for the system to stop and take a corrective action. And we were able to develop this, this process and this algorithm and give it to them. What I'm trying to say is that there's a very large possible range of, of activities where it could be used. Next slide, please. So looking at where artificial intelligence is currently being used. So traditionally information technology and marketing has been the two biggest users of AI. So if you go online, you go to and Google something, the next time when you are on Facebook, on, on, on Amazon or something, it will show you products which you had Googled on. That's marketing. And that is again very closely related to information technology. So IT and marketing has been the two biggest users. Now finance and accounting is also taking up and customer service is also coming and started using artificial intelligence. Next slide, please. However, there is a very big possibility of industries which are into manufacturing using artificial intelligence. However, they would be requiring IoT Internet of Things to be able to do that. And well, this is a slide which I have again borrowed. This shows what are the various aspects and benefits of using an Internet of Things or industrial Internet of Things in industries. And this just shows that improvement of operational efficiency, improvement of productivity, create business opportunities and reducing downtime and things like that are one of the basic reasons which people attribute and that's why they want to go into IoT. Next slide, please. So this was the prediction. Of course, the prediction has now gone haywire and these are some of the predictions by Morgan Stanley and other companies as to how the IoT business and IoT market size will increase in 2020 and 21. Of course, they never knew that we would be having Corona and, and this may be something which could be which could be disrupted. However, having said that, as a matter of fact, this may actually be surpassed because of Corona, there has been less accessibility of machines and we have been more dependent upon connected devices. And I think that is really a very unique opportunity because IoT may then become the, the tool to go to or the go-to tool basically. Next slide, please. So now I, I kind of gave you a sum of what really artificial intelligence is. I can talk more about it, but I have limited time. I gave you what IoT is and why IoT is needed. So IoT is needed to feed in data to AI. However, the key aspect is that it's well and good. You can do a lot of things with AI, but how will it generate value to me? How can you monetize IoT and AI in textile industry? And this is a very nice, you know, uh, graph which has been created by McKinsey, which in a sense summarizes all the values which can be created, how the monetization of IoT and AI in textile industry could be. So if you start looking at, and I'll start from the resource process, you could have an intelligent IoT which can do a real-time optimization of your process. So your process can be, can be controlled real-time and thus be more efficient. A smart energy consumption, as I just talked about, especially the dryers and textile industries, we are working very closely with Rohan and others uh, on, on aspects of looking at how dryers can be more smart so you can, you can decrease the energy consumption. Asset utilization is another very big area. The aspect is that asset utilization, one does not really attribute, but has the largest potential of cost savings and monetization. So for instance, downtime of a machine. If you think about machine maintenance, you have essentially three ways of maintaining a machine. One is a machine maintenance when there is a failure. Now we had a case study in which we went to a garment factory and the people in, a, in an entire line, about 40 people were, were stitching things together. And in that case, if there is ever a machine failure, a stitching machine fails, you have a phenomenal loss because that really loss gets percolated down the line because if this person gets delayed, the other person gets delayed. And almost on a running basis, there are failures almost every single day in one or the other line. So machine failures could be very, very expensive. Now this could be in a small scenario like where you have a small stitching machine which is failing, but it could also happen in very large machineries. Imagine if there's a large machinery where a component fails and if that component failure leads to cascading effect of failure of other components, it can become a really very expensive thing. So machine maintenance is I think one of the biggest aspects which could be used for monetization of IoT and AI. So you could perform maintenance once the things fail, but as I just said that it's very expensive to do that. The other possibility which machineries can be used for is to basically have a regular periodic maintenance. Now periodic maintenance is always going to be more aggressive than what is required. Why? Because you don't want a failure. So thus you will be doing maintenance more often than required and thus you'll be over maintaining your machine and that again
again will lead to over a cost and thus predictive maintenance is one aspect which becomes the artificial intelligence can do predictive maintenance so your machine knows when it's going to fail and it can in three days from now i might fail and this is something which can really be directly translated into into monetization it can be directly translated into value to the, to the industry another aspect is labor now the entire aspect of iot in ai is not to create automation i'm not asking for automation but i'm trying to empower the labor because automation replaces the labor but if we have iot and ai that that can empower the labor so the labor can be far more productive they will be better aware of what to do they will be able to conform to specific ways of doing things they can improve an excellent example of this is cricket if you look at a cricket you don't want to automate a cricket you want sachin tendulkar and, and virat kohli to bat however artificial intelligence and ai can be used to tell as to what would be the best way to handle a specific ball or what would be the best technique and these are aspects where we can actually empower this is where i very strongly feel that we are different from germany and, and europe specifically where there is a labor shortage and they are trying to go with iot and ai along with automation and that automation is essentially to replace human requirement in india on the other hand i think humans are a huge asset and we can use iot and ai to complement them and that can create a unique value so india has a, in a sense a very unique opportunity in this area of course investors quality time to to market supply demand and service all of these aspects basically can be augmented by iot so in a nutshell if i say that the way the value and monetization can happen in a textile industry is to make things cheaper to make things better in quality and to make them faster and all of these three things can be done by artificial intelligence using iot so now i'm going to my last slide next slide please so now i will summarize that artificial intelligence as i said can provide a very decisive advantage to a business and moving forward that would be something which we have to take advantage of and artificial intelligence is hungry for data and iot will be the one which will generate the data and feed that data to the artificial intelligence systems now there are another aspect of iot devices where the artificial intelligence is married with the iot device which we call as the edge computing devices and that is something which is gaining a lot of of but these are micro details i don't want to go into that coming to the monetization as to how will you monetize our ai ai is well good but how does it bring value if i have to invest let's say a couple of lakhs of rupees how will i be able to get return on investment and how will it bring value to me and that's where i go back to my three phrases cheaper better and faster and that can only be achieved once you have an understanding of the domain knowledge so a generalized ai cannot be used a person or a industry working in general <coughs> artificial intelligence cannot do this unless they have a domain knowledge and finally msme i would say has a huge role to play in the iot deployment and the reason is that they are local so if they are local they can provide local customized solutions and this is very very important because the supervised learning requires you to have a customized solution for each and every shop floor and industry so you can't expect an mnc which has a general product you can't just plug and play an ai you need to train the ai and that has to be done through supervised learning and that's why msmes will play a very huge role the other reason is that msmes are very very cost effective if you go and buy a operation you will end up spending very little sum of money and be able to pay all that there is more essentially able to create far more cost effective solutions for you and the reason is overheads and the processes whereas they can cut all of those and finally the technology the world of ai is changing by the day literally by the day my presentation day before yesterday is different from today and will be different tomorrow and this is only possible with msmes who are very agile they can bring in technology on a daily basis whereas large corporations have huge processes a new technology comes it will take a very long time for them to incorporate that so this is my overall uh, summary of of artificial intelligence and iot in in textile and in general uh, manufacturing industry back to you mr narsman uh, thank you professor rashim thank you so much for uh, you know taking us through uh, for a detailed presentation
on using uh, mr Pro uh, professor asim if i may ask you a presentation detailed on using ait to reduce cost and improve efficiency while while we talked about improving consistently in production reducing defects and identifying areas of improvement do you feel we have training infrastructure and available to make our managers uh, smart managers how in your opinion institutions like iit can help the msmes that's a very very important aspect actually because the at the end of the day ai will be as good as as the managers understand it actually and uh, this is one area which i would say that we are not really doing very well however there has been in the last 3 4 years there has been a lot of progress so for instance in iit bombay and many other iits we have several courses which are happening we do a lot of webinars on on aspects of ai and usage of ai but there is far more room actually so there is a specific masters program which iit bombay for instance is starting in machine in in aspects of industry 4.0 and there are many such small short courses also which are being planned by iit bombay and other iits but i think that is a very very important aspect and industry has to work very closely with academia and this is specific aspect to reskill to understand what are the opportunities so the managers need to know not the micro details but they need to have an understanding of what all is possible and what are the limitations so that is very 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 true a lot is happening but a lot needs to be done oh great that's an interesting note but we also understand that in the corona situation or the new normal expected that need of need to contact business over digital forms but do you feel being automated and efficient will help uh, msmes like you know plug and play into global supply chain or do you see more acceptance coming from global brands so actually this is very unique you know in some sense uh, people are saying that the corona pandemic has created an opportunity uh, and i would i would put it the other way around i'll say that it has actually forced us to think at at things which we were not doing fast enough and in some sense we will leapfrog what others so if you look at europe and us and other advanced nations they have a very large expensive infrastructure which they have used for for aspects associated with iot and uh, and the online infrastructure for their industry however in our case we don't have such a huge infrastructure but because of this pandemic we are being forced and that is actually leading to low bandwidth geographies and that way we will essentially sometimes be from other day by and to the line we miss with, with you know very 3g and 4g networks and thus there is a there is in a sense i would say a, a opportunity or at least like a room where we will be using this more often so in some sense yes this pandemic has ex, uh, you know accelerated the process which otherwise was taking slow and that acceleration has further led to some kind of a leap frog which has also what we saw in the for instance the cellular industry where the landlines the telephone landlines were very slow but the cell phone industry suddenly took over and we never really had an entire coverage of the nation with the landlines but we suddenly had a coverage with the with the cell phone so i think that same kind of situation but that window is very small we have to very closely work together industry academia and government and government has a very huge role to play in all of this basically great so the buzzword is collaboration <laughs> uh thank you so much um okay i'll um, so before i call upon the next speaker i once again request all the participants to use our like you know dashboard chatbot to post the questions and please like you know uh, mention to whom uh, the questions are addressed and please mention your name also from which company you are representing uh and the third speaker for the day for the evening uh, and mr rohan patodia i'm sure like many of uh, many of you uh, you know about him so but just can just take a minute uh Mr. Patodia is a co-founder of Dolly Materials Mumbai, the technical textile divisions of Patodia Group, which has been in textile trade for over eight decades. He has uh, he has a family background and a deep understanding of technical textiles. Uh, his experience in finance and domestic and global uh, settings brings the network and sales capability with him. He has been heading uh, at Dolly uh, Materials. He has been heading product sourcing and innovation, and helps create technical tie-ups with local as well as foreign partners. he has been instrumental in deploying iot solutions for utility management at uh, at the at his indian uh, indian textile factory over to mr patodia thank you uh, so just going to uh, start by saying thank you to textpressel and the business standard for putting uh, you know this webinar together 
uh, and thank you to Asim as well as uh, Mr. Ashwini Agarwal for you know taking their valuable time and uh, you know sharing their thoughts with us about the industry. So uh, just jumping right into it, a lot of stuff has already been covered uh, by Mr. Asim Tiwari and Mr. Ashwini Agarwal, but just kind of summarizing, you know, from an industry standpoint, what I've also learned and uh, what I've seen. Right. So one is uh, by using IoT and AI at the shop floor level, you're able to create. Um, you're able to identify where problems actually occur, right? Uh, which is in industry really important because once you nail down on what exactly the problem is or the bottleneck is, you can solve that problem and then move forward, right? So it creates a lot of accountability and it also makes your managers much smarter. So for, uh, if you are a manager or if you are the management, senior management of the company, you can track on a day-to-day -day and a minute-to-minute -minute level as to what is exactly going on in the factory. Right. So this allows you also to have complete transparency on what is going on. So it is like a counter check for you to see whether what your manager is saying is true or not. Right. Second is efficiency increase. Right. So reducing of errors. A lot of the work that we do in, in most industries, which are uh, commodity based, are uh, the repetitive tasks. Right. So we don't have to really uh, use our brains each time to be able to create something new. We have to be smart, effective, efficient and fast. Right. So. AI can help you reduce that as you, as Asim has pointed out uh, multiple times during his presentation, uh, even errors can be reduced in specifically the textile segment, whether it is spinning, weaving, knitting, dyeing, processing, garmenting, they're all solvable issues, which can, uh, which AI can help solve, right? The third is cost saving, right? So once you know exactly which machines are taking a maximum amount of your power, Right, or which operator is uh, not correctly utilizing the machine, you can work with that operator right, to help reduce the cost or to explain to him exactly what the issues are and how he should be solving those problems. Right? So that bottleneck then gets uh, opened up and you're allowed to uh, save further costs. Right? So this will also help increase your productivity. This kind of ties into the predictive maintenance that uh, Asim spoke about because now you can plan your downtime. Right. So it's not a reactive situation anymore. It's a proactive situation, right? You can plan your production team can plan exactly when uh, downtime is going to be taken. Your engineers know exactly which machines they should be looking into, which they should be, uh, you know, spending time fixing, right? What parts need to be gotten. So all of these things add to your bottom line, right? It increases your efficiency your productivity and definitely adds to your bottom line, right? The, second, the uh, other two important points about IoT and AI is it's is, it's a tool and not a substitute, right? So you can utilize it as a tool. Uh, you can work with your managers, you can work with your employees to make them more productive, to make them uh, you know, smarter, but you cannot substitute them, right? Because for example, let's say the AI tells you predictive maintenance needs to be done on X machine. The AI can't solve the machine problem, right? Nor can it solve your production issue. So it's a tool that helps your team further understand how to deal with these problems, right? The second is there is a huge uh, misconception or a myth, right? That this is all very expensive. It isn't. If you go to the bigger companies, yes, it is going to be expensive, but there are a number of companies in India, right? Which are smart, which are dedicated to textiles uh, and textile technology, right? Which are, which could be considered as startups, right? And they can come in, help you, they can customize stuff for you. They can help you add more and more data, more and more analytical levels, and they can do a very, very good job for you. So please don't think that you have to spend, you know, lots and lots of money to make your smart factory a smart factory. You do not have to spend as much money as you think. So moving on to product technology, just to uh, jump in really briefly into the GHCL example that was given by Mr. Ashwini Agarwal. Uh, GHCL uh, has not invested any of its own money into CapEx, right, to create this new product line. They have taken technology from one partner, uh, which is, I think, in Germany. The other one, which is uh, Recycle uh, Pet from Reliance. They've put it together and created a third product, right, which is value addition for their retailers and their customers. Right. So they have not, uh, you don't necessarily have to invest in technology each time or innovation each time to get a reward for it. If you have an existing infrastructure, the question should start becoming, what can we do with our existing infrastructure to increase the value addition that we can provide to our customers? Right. And the, the best part is being an MSME, you don't have to have a huge amount of, um, you know, you don't have to have a huge capacity to be able to service these customers. They'll be happier, right. If you are a smaller player, uh, because you don't require as much capacity to service them and uh, they will be much happier to work along with you for it too. So uh, this is an interesting model that one should really think about, right? Uh, where you can partner with companies from abroad, you can partner or you can create your own innovations in India, put them together, package it well, 
as Mr. Agarwal has said, and you know, market it to your customers abroad. The second is Arvind Mills has tied up with uh, Hike, you know, which is an antiviral uh, finishes uh, company to create antiviral clothing that they want to export overseas. So that is again uh, an example of a foreign company coming to India, tying up with an Indian company that has mainly traditional. Um, you know, infrastructure and traditional machines and utilizing that for higher value added products, right? Um, playing on trends. This is something that I think the Indian industry should definitely, uh, you know, take into consideration and, you know, should be a part of everyone's strategic plan going forward. So, for example, there's a company in India called Supply Compass, right? Supply Compass helps you um, get certified to show that, you know, you're not using child labor, uh, you're using authentic cotton, you're using organic cotton, uh, you know, whatever it might be, uh, whatever it might be. And they help connect you to brands or they work with you, uh, you know, to provide um, higher value added items to European and US customers, right? So that is another partnership that one can look at, you know, coming together, work with Supply Compass and, and uh, you know, take something like that forward. The other is, uh, so, you know, a lot of talk has come about uh, you know, what can an Indian company do, right, um, in a new category using cotton uh, as a raw material. So it's an Indian startup called Tumsware. Uh, Mr. Raja, I know you posted a question, so this is the name of the company, uh, which uses specialized finishes. Their entire business model and strategic competitive advantage stands only in creating new and unique finishes, right? So they have taken on the challenge of simply making the finishes and marketing those finishes, right? They don't do anything else, right? So this is an interesting example of a company which has come in and said, we will focus on finishes. We will work with industry partners when it comes to uh, spinning, weaving, knitting, dyeing, processing, uh, you know, garmenting. But uh, some parts of this technology will be ours, right? So this is a partnership driven model of an Indian company, right? Which has done really, really well using digital channels in India, right? So the opportunities for the MSME sector, so to start with, uh, even if you, you know, if you're a little skeptical about, you know, what is going on, I would say start with an Excel sheet, right? Take an Excel sheet and note down, um, you know, start listing exactly what products you're selling to which customers, to which countries, um, you know, what colors, what construction of fabric, um, you know, and start analyzing and seeing trends within that data itself. That will give you a much better idea about how to forecast your own demand, right? You don't have to get into very heavy or intricate uh, data analytics, you could simply start with this to build your own understanding about what data analytics is, right? The second is working and collaborating, like, um, you know, Asim has also pointed out, is collaborating, working and innovating together. So for example, let's say there's a manufacturer and a trader, right? They can come together where the trader can say that I have, you know, X number of customers who are demanding these products. Why don't we come together and create um, a new unique technology or an innovation or why don't we partner with a foreign company right and uh, build out that product in india and then provide it to our foreign customers right the second could be you have a bunch of manufacturers who come together you know and say that okay fine you know five of us want to come together and we want to create this technology it could be in spinning it could be in weaving or knitting or it could be in the final product as well right so you could the other part of looking at it is you could have a spinning company a weaving and a knitting and a knitting company you can have a uh, dyeing and processing house and you can have a garmenting factory that come together, right? All independent, come together, create an innovation and work on each one's strength, right? So you don't have to add additional capex. You don't have to uh, invest hugely just by yourself. You can work with people who have different skill sets, different abilities, right? To come together and create these value adds. The other, the last thing I'd like to talk about is the government of India also helps fund these initiatives, right? So you do, you can do an asset light innovation model, right? Which also happens a lot in foreign countries. So if you see anywhere in Europe or USA, universities, uh, you know, they come together and they come together with the industry and the universities have all the research and development, the technical people, and the industry comes in with, a, you know, a problem or something that they want to solve or an innovation that they want to create. Right. So in, in, uh, in India, for example, we have 70% um, funding from the government and 30% funding from industry, which is not an upfront payment, but a staggered payment. Right. And you work with the center of excellence. It could be IIT. It could be, uh, you know, uh, any of the other centers of excellence, Atira or uh, anyone else uh, to create new uh, innovations and new technology that you think could be, uh, you know, something that could be interesting for market. Right. So uh, please learn to think differently, think strategically, think 
uh, bigger because as you can see there are different models without capex right which indian companies have taken and they have uh, materialized on it and they have taken it forward and they have created more value addition than the conventional traditional uh, textiles that they were previously doing so with that i'd like to end and uh, hand it back to our moderator thank you thank you thank you so much this is uh, in fact a uh, very interesting three keywords you know think differently strategically and i like that one which you started with tools which is like this is a tool to substitute i think that is the one buzzword like you know everybody should keep it in mind okay uh, so before i move on to the q and a session we started getting some questions uh, mr rogan i have two questions if i may take before like you know the question starts lines up you you had this, uh, you had this experience of iot utility implementation uh, in an indian factory what were the practical difficulties faced by you in such a project you know it could be like either is it finance or lack of understanding on iot or using iot post implementation what are the challenges you faced so uh, surprisingly when i went into it i thought uh, you know just as you did uh, just describe that it would be really tricky to convince management uh, you know workers would not want it uh, people would be very skeptical about it uh, in fact it was the opposite people really wanted it uh, engineers were really happy that we had it uh, utility management was very very happy because what they were doing is they used to manually enter everything otherwise so they couldn't uh, even uh, they were only putting a, putting it on an excel sheet and you know analyzing it they would uh, they were simply lost data for them they would literally just noting it down so when we implemented it the hardest thing to do was to change the older meters right uh, was to change the older meters because you cannot use those to collect data they are not built to do that so it was just the initial capex of uh, just changing those meters after that uh, it was uh, smooth flowing most of the way we've luckily not even gotten calls after for servicing or anything because you can pretty much just do it online that's interesting great great okay so we will take questions now uh, we have got like couple of questions again once again i request the participants you know to use the uh, group chat box to pose the questions uh, before okay we have two questions one to dr uh, dr ashwini one question is from ravi mr ravi uh, in traditional apparel textiles cotton spinning where our capacity is more than demand future competitiveness what is the future competitiveness for copper, cotton spinning this is to professor dr ashwini dr ashwini agarwal so for for any any product whether it is a spun yarn or a woven uh, fabric or any material so we need to look at making uh, yarns which are of a speciality type which can bring fashion into the fabric so definitely uh, one can look at uh, just if we are just <coughs> the spinning uh, the performance of a normal yarn then obviously it will become highly competitive and will not be able to sell if the demand is not there but if you start to create uh, fashion yarns hybrid yarns uh, all kinds of uh, materials which can be spun to create effects in the fabrics i think it could create a niche market uh, or a market which can grow uh, with time so one has to tie up spinners have to tie up with fabric and uh, fashion garment Uh, manufacturers uh, to start selling them on making yarns which they require for their fabrics and that that would probably create a new demand so it's all creating new new things and then creating the entire chain of innovation and then branding it out if i could just okay. add uh, uh, on top of what mr agarwal just said is um, you know there are certain specialty yarns which are made using cotton right so they embed copper they embed silver at the spinning stage right and uh, it doesn't require huge capex again so those are huge value additions that uh, you know traditional mills also can look at getting into right where you can extract higher value addition on on the revenue or the net profit or whatever it is but it gives you uh, you know that edge in the market as well uh, if you google if you google it you can probably figure out uh, you know which which are which others companies that are doing it and get an idea from them Uh, thanks for adding i hope mr ravi uh, found it um, another question for uh, professor ashwini uh, india is uh, uh, india is known for cotton textiles but lacks in branding i think that is the one point which you also mentioned it is high time to think of branding cotton textiles as usa did for cotton fiber eu for uh, fast fashion what indian manufacturers to do for collective branding of cotton textile and harvesting premium price so collective branding is uh, 
is a different idea from branding for a particular company. Uh, they're two different ball games altogether. So yes, uh, we must uh, talk about cotton industry as such. We need to brand it in a manner that we remove uh, uh, defects and uh, color uh, problems and shrinkage problems uh, from most of our products. Then we can brand that, okay, it's a cotton from India. So right now we say cotton from a company, we should be able to one day say it is cotton from India, which is, which is superior or, uh, or in, in uh, tackling certain kinds of properties. So if that has to be done, then like uh, Texposil, uh, some organization has to come forward to create those kind of a brand and their members have to then pledge to give those kind of quality uh, and then a brand can be created. So yes, collective brands are a possibility and that would definitely help the Indian companies uh, be more competitive in the international market. Great. Again, collaboration there comes. Okay, uh, to, um, to, Professor, to Professor Asim from Mr. Ravindranathan, uh, can you tell about practical applications of AI in other textile manufacturing countries? To what extent is the Indian textile manufacturers adopting AI in their business? Professor Asim? Asim, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, I realized. Yeah, so uh, this is something which India is actually quite uh, behind in some sense. And I think that is one of the main reasons where once we were very big in textile and are now not really having such a huge presence. If you look at specifically Germany, which has done phenomenal in the area of textile and other aspects, especially weaving, uh, their instruments and the machinery which they make, they themselves have the machinery itself having those IoT devices. So they have by design, it's not a retrofit. So most of these machines and modern machineries in Europe especially are so built that they have these artificial intelligent built-in IoT devices in it. So in that sense, India is in a sense far behind because we don't have all of these things. Whereas in, in Europe and, and other places in the US, specifically in Europe, they are far more advanced. Now coming to that aspect, however, we don't really have to necessarily change our capital equipment to have these, these built in. We can also retrofit them. And that is something which we really need to be aware of. And at a very fractional cost, we can retrofit them. And what sometimes we feel is that our Indian manufacturers and we work with few of them who are trying to manufacture uh, machine, machine tools basically for, for the cotton and for the uh, textile industry they really do not know that how they can incorporate these tools. And I think we can actually have a huge uh, industry, specifically the capital goods industry in the, in the textile area, where we could have a value addition done at the very beginning of these capital goods. And in that sense, India, however, is still quite behind. So Europe is much advanced than us and we are, we are lacking. In that sense, actually China has done a lot of stuff. So China has gone far, far ahead of us. Uh, so that's another aspect. But again, I would say there are some subtle aspects where we have advantage and we should be able to manage that. Great. Thank you so much. One point on this as well. Uh, there are factories, for example, in the US, uh, right, where they have tried vertical integration using uh, automation plus AI. So if there's a breakage in uh, yarn spinning or something, they're able to identify it using a camera. Um, you know, they're, they're completely end-to-end -end automated. So you'll have a robot moving, for example, a fabric, or, you know, which has come off uh, the dryer or something. It'll move to robotic trolley to the next uh, station, right? So it, uh, there are all these different aspects which are taking place. So a lot of them do use AI. Uh, a lot of them do use machine learning. A lot of them do use robotics. So that's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we don't have no more questions. So if there is no more questions, um, can we go to the next one? Before I, you know, go to my, okay, there is no questions. Before I go to my official Thanksgiving, can, we, can I request Mr. Srinivasan to speak a few words? Sir? Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. I think we had a very, very interesting presentation from all three speakers. Uh, a lot of interesting questions come to, and I'm sure there will be a lot of takeaway for all the uh, people who have attended the uh, uh, webinar today. I would once again like to thank uh, Business Standard for uh, organizing this and uh, thank you very much.